today under your care and protection. Thank you for this day and for your loving kindness that never fails us. We thank you for those with us in this church and who are with us online and that you would guide us, our thoughts and actions, to bring you glory. Strengthen us and fill us with your peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our opening hymn is Tell Me the Stories of Jesus, number 295. to make. Uh, most of them you can see here. Uh, board member signed to assist financial secretary uh, Charlie Brown today and me next week. Okay. No adult <laughs> choir tonight. Practice will resume in August. No praise group. Uh, practice will resume on August 14. Wednesday is the Bible study at 10, or 10 o'clock and 6.30 p.m. And there's a church directory sign up still going on. You can visit the site and create your own account. 
there will be a one-day vacation Bible school on Saturday, August 5th from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. and we will have more details in the near future. Uh, the flowers here are in, uh, given by Dickie Jeter in memory of his mama Louise Bowen. Um, Louise Bowen Jeter for her birthday on July 26. Are there any other announcements? Okay. Um, we do have um, a phrase, a couple of phrases here. Congratulations to Luke Daniel and Haley Moody on their engagement. Congratulations to proud grandparents Debbie and Doc Smithson on the birth of their fourth grandchild, Hayes Lucas Smithson, born on July 12th. And congratulations to Will and Caitlin Daniel on the birth of their son, Wyatt Lee Daniel. And he was born on July 14th. And if you didn't know better, you'd think he was bigger twins with his bigger brother. Uh, Ray and Genevieve Covington celebrated their 68th wedding anniversary. The mission trip participants are back safe and sound. Billy Wilkinson is out of his neck brace, and we see he's here. Okay, you're released from the restrictions. I got some jobs for you. <laughs> and uh, I, I guess you all heard about Jackie Daniels' misfortune, and she's uh, she did well in surgery, and she's home recovering and doing well, I hope. Um, I don't have any other announcements that I can see. Um, now we're going to have the celebration of unity, and that will be by the River Webster. Grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus Christ. This week I will be leaving to go to Kentucky to attend our General Assembly, and I'm not sure if anyone here, or maybe Helen, I'm not sure, maybe Randy, but there, um, every uh, two years, there is a General Assembly, and also we have a Regional Assembly, but this one is the first time we will be back after four years of not seeing each other. So it is going to be a good, good, good celebration. There's about 2,500 members of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ from the uh, United States and Canada that will be attending. And we have an app. And that app also tells me everyone that will be attending. So one night, it took me a long time, but one night I did, I believe I got down to maybe the H's. <laughs> I stopped there, but I did, or maybe it was a little bit longer, but I did notice that your former pastor, Anthony, uh, will be attending, so I look forward to be able to, to uh, uh, speaking with Anthony, but it is going to be a wonderful time of celebration and learning and fellowshipping and, of course, eating, you know, in, in Kentucky, uh, but also important just sacred work and wonderful well worship and some great preachers as well. So I will ask Taylor to uh, provide a link to you for you if you would be interested in watching some of the worship services that I will uh, be attending. And so, you know, I feel like that we're worshiping together. But one of the things that we do in the disciples tradition, uh, some churches, um, do this every Sunday, but one thing that we do, especially at regional assemblies and at general assemblies, is that we um, recite our statement of faith, or what we call the preamble, to the design of the Christian church, Disciples of Christ. And so if you are able to stand, I'd like to ask you to stand as, and, and again, if you watch the worship services, you will be be able to see us also stating our statement of faith. And for those of you that may be new to it and maybe not realize that we have one, there's no surprises. Everything that you hear and everything we recite this morning.
morning was what we do believe here at Perseverance Christian Church. So if you would stand if you are able that we are going to together recite the statement of faith. As members of the Christian Church, we confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and proclaim him Lord and Savior of the world. In Christ's name and by his grace, we accept our mission of witness and service to all people. We rejoice in God, maker of heaven and earth, and in God's covenant of love, which binds us to God and to one another. Through baptism into Christ, we enter into newness of life and are made one with the whole people of God. In the communion of the Holy Spirit, we are joined together in discipleship and in obedience to Christ. At the table of the Lord, we celebrate with thanksgiving the saving acts and presence of Christ. Within the universal church, we receive the gift of mystery and the light of scripture. In the bonds of Christian faith, we yield ourselves to God that we may serve the one whose kingdom has no end. Blessing, glory, and honor be to God. Amen. You may be seated. So I will pray for you while I am gone, and I ask for you to pray for me also as we make this journey and as we spend time uh, in Kentucky, again, fellowshipping, worshiping, and doing sacred work on behalf of this church. And I will take you with me. Safe travels to all the ball teams, Bloomberg Crowd, uh, Ann Flick, Kathy Coffey, Billy Arms, Steve Myers, Bob Spencer, and Tommy Barnes, and the family of uh, Gus Mitchell's sister in law and Warren Wilkinson Scott's father. Is there anyone else to? Add to this list. Okay, if you will keep them in your prayers this week, um, I'm sure that they and their families will appreciate it. And now I'll have meditation and morning prayer um, with the communion hymn after you are my all and all. Number five, eight. Ray, Ray Spence. Spence. Family that, that's still in Park's system. Oh, okay. Family of Ray Spence. Okay, anyone else? Joyce Daniel. Joyce Daniel. Bridgman. meditation and morning prayer.
Almighty, gracious, loving God. The story of your love makes us realize that there are many others as well as ourselves who need your help and your grace. And so we bring our prayers to you. For those who suffer pain and for those whose loneliness is self-destroying, for those whose minds are disturbed and for those who live lives of quiet despair, for those who have not had the opportunities to realize their potentials, for those who are satisfied with something less than the life for which they were made, for those who know their guilt, their shallowness, their need, but do not know of Jesus, for those who know that they must shortly die, or those who cannot wait to die. Gracious God, your Son has taken all our sufferings upon himself and has transformed them. Lord, we offer our prayers to take the suffering of others upon ourselves, and so by your grace become the agents of your transforming love. Lord, we especially pray this morning for those on our prayer list and for those who have been added. We ask for prayers for those who have lost loved ones. We ask for comfort and for peace and for strength for those who do not know where to turn. Lord, we have many friends and family who are sick and who have been through surgeries and have been through so much. And we just ask as the great physician to touch them with healing, to provide them with relief, to help them in their misery and suffering, and to be able to give, give them the peace and the comfort that they need to be able to make it through the day. Lord, we pray for those who do not know Jesus that's here in this community, and we ask for you to touch them with just the knowledge of who you are and to help us be an instrument in letting them know about the love of Jesus Christ and all that he has done. Lord, we thank you for summers. We thank you for those who are vacationing, and we ask them for you to bless them and to bless their travels and to safely bring them home. Lord, we thank you for this land. We thank you for our farmers here in this community, and we ask for you to keep them safe, Lord. Keep them safe during this heat and keep them safe from injury. Lord, we pray the prayer that your son, Jesus Christ, taught us to pray. Praying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. morning we are gathered in the name of Jesus our Savior and our living God. We recall how Jesus made himself known to his friends in the breaking of bread and how their hearts were set ablaze as they talked and communed with him. May our hearts rejoice this morning and our tongues be filled with peace. Let us be filled with praise as we come to this table to meet Jesus here at this table. We will now prepare our hearts and our minds for communion this morning. Our hymn of invitation is on page 583, You Are My All.
us riches beyond all measure. You can only return a fraction of what we owe you. And we ask, Lord, that you will bless our offerings and help us to use them wisely in your service and for your glory. Amen. <laughs> Seeds and weeds and harvest. So I got some here. Got some seeds. What kind do you think they are? Wheat. Yeah, wheat seed. Yeah. You throw one of those little suckers on the ground, what happens? Grow. Yeah, plant grow. Yeah. Got something else. Yeah, you can't tell Eli where I got this from. <laughs> What's this look like? Corn? Yeah. Feel that, Eli. Got one of the small ones. So if we plant one of those, what would happen? It'd grow too, right? What do we do with this sometimes when we harvest it to both this age? What do you have? Corn on the cob? What do you do with it? Eat it, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes we let it get hard, right? What do you cut it with? Combine. Combine. There you go. When you harvest it, well, Reverend Donald's going to talk about harvesting. So when we think of harvesting, you, you gather stuff up, right? Go get it, put it on your plate, <laughs> put it in a grain bin, but you do something to bring it in, to bring it together. Well, Reverend Donald's going to talk about the way Jesus harvests us today a little bit, I think. So just think about and remember that the way we harvest is one thing. The way Jesus harvests is something else.
Okay? Thank you. Yeah, you want a, you want a bullet? <laughs> Slaves said to him, 
then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, no, for in gathering the weeds, you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest, and at harvest time I will tell the reapers. Collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. He put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all the seeds, but when it is grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. Jesus told the crowds all these things in parables. Without a parable, he told them nothing. This was to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet. I will open my mouth to speak in parables. I will proclaim what has been hidden from the foundation of the world. Then he left the crowds and he went into the house. And his disciples approached him saying, explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evildoers. And they will throw them into the furnace of fire where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun of their father. Let everyone with ears listen. May God bless the reading and hearing of God's holy word. Would you please pray with me? Almighty, gracious, loving God, may the words of my mouth be acceptable unto you, and may the meditations of our hearts be also. Amen. I think it's important to Think about the always the backstory of our scriptures and our lessons, and how for ministers we look at many what we call criticisms. And one of the criticisms that I've approached this by is the historical criticism of basically what was going on at the time and why this parable needed to be shared by the author, which is Matthew. And the Gospels were written for the purpose of teaching the early church. So in all the Gospels, that is why they were written, to be able to help the church. So now Matthew's church has enemies among them. And he uses this parable to teach the church that there are those who have entered into your Christian fellowship. Those who profess and say they're disciples, but yet do not want to practice his teachings. Maybe they are disciples that are influenced by the Roman Empire or, for us, influenced by the world. And in this allegory, of wheat and weeds, the weeds look like wheat. The weeds grow right beside the wheat, about the same height. So to the eye, it is hard to distinguish the children of the evil one from the children of the kingdom. And it's hard to distinguish the children of the evil one and which ones have penetrated the church. So church growth is happening at the time of Matthew's writing in the first century, and more and more people were coming to follow Jesus, but many are coming but not doing what Jesus has called them to do. I want to call them and describe them as kudzu people. <laughs> and you can quote me on that. extract. The slaves, the members of 
this Christian church, mainly Jewish Christians, want to throw out the Kudzu people. They want to throw out those who have infiltrated the church without any desire to follow Jesus. But Jesus tells them not to judge. When I come back, Jesus says, I, not you, I will separate the weeds from the wheat. Don't worry about yourself. Do not judge them. This parable is about grace. Jesus teaches them. And so do we also want to hear. Jesus gives them more time. Just like he does us. He says it's not harvest time yet. That is grace. This parable is a good place for us to take stock in our own practices. We come to church not to have God affirm our lifestyle or our choices. And let's face it, we are human. But rather, we come to church we come to the sanctuary to <coughs> offer our life in whatever shape it is for helping those in need and sharing the good news, the sacrificial life of Jesus and the good news of salvation. Jesus uses this parable to teach what the kingdom of heaven will be like, and it is like a great feast, a place where all of God's children will take residence. A place where all the faithful will gather, a place for those who waited upon Jesus and prepared for his return. And because Matthew cared about the church and not being seen as hypocrites, it mattered to him how the church was going to be viewed to outsiders. And this is our call today. To not be hypocrites and continue to work towards holiness in our chaotic, our modern day world. So how do we lead lives in which we are seen as wheat rather than weeds and included in the harvest at the end of the age? The author and West Singer family seem to explore this question. Sarah Arthur and Aaron Wessinger decided to take stock of their own practices and tells the story of how their families set out to live a life more fully aligned with Jesus' teachings. And they named the book A Year of Small Things. So for exactly one year, they followed a movement called New Monasticism. For they knew that with jobs and children and crazy schedules, becoming a monk wasn't an option for them. So these are the 12 marks that they practiced. One was they became invested in a community where they could be closer to the poor. Now this reminds me of a teacher in Radford who at the beginning of the school year, gathers up her teachers and they get on the bus and they drive around to some of the most more impoverished areas of the city. And she says, next time that the homework is late, ask yourself, did they have electricity to be able to complete it? These two families also shared economic resources with fellow community members and the needy. They showed hospitality to the stranger. They lamented for racial divisions within the church with an active pursuit of a just reconciliation. They submitted to Christ's body, the church. They intentionally studied the way of Christ like an apprentice. They nurtured common life among members of their church and their community. They supported singles and married couples and their children, and they cared for their plot of earth along with supporting their local economy. They became peacemakers in the midst of violence and conflict resolution within their communities because they believe you can't be proud 
of being in the protest line if you can't make up with your family or your neighbors. And they committed to a disciplined, contemplative, reflective life. Later, I will show, share what they have learned at the end of that year. For the church, which Matthew writes, he includes this parable of Jesus on the wheat and weeds to inform the Christian community about the importance of living a kind of life that follows what Jesus taught. Remember, a parable compares the familiar with the unfamiliar. In this case, the familiar was the practice on their land as farmers of having to manually separate the chaff from the wheat and then burning the chaff, that was the familiar. But the unfamiliar Jesus is using as allegory about wheat and weeds to, is to teach us and was to teach the disciples about Judgment Day and who will make up the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is teaching disciples not to judge others and denies any one permission to single out another is anything but good. The good news is that Jesus has been leaving the field alone for now. But let's face it. The weeds are sometimes hard to work around. Weeds wrap themselves in ways where it's hard to produce fruit for the kingdom. About 30 years ago, I got lost walking one of the more difficult trails at Canning Valley, West Virginia. I would assume that probably Larry knows Canning Valley. And I had to walk through a marsh to get to a highway. This parable reminds me of that time because the amount of effort it took to walk through that marsh, water up to my thighs, is the amount of effort it takes to walk through weeds. To be a part of a church where there are committed disciples is easy. But to be part of a church where there are people who doesn't Practice what it means to be a disciple is hard. Let's just kick them out. The slave seems to be thinking. But Jesus teaches, let them grow together. Friends, I don't know if you feel like a weed sometimes. Maybe at some point we all do choking out the testimony of Jesus' love for the least of these? Or whether or not you know in your heart that how you work and live contributes to spreading love for all people. But I know through this parable, our job is to preach and teach the good news and to serve the least of these. Many kids emailed me a great article from public theologian Richard Rohr about his belief that when Christianity, and this is during Constantine's time, became the official religion of the Roman Empire. He writes that we lost the essence of the gospel as good news for the poor. Friends, we too lose a great deal when America attempts to place a claim that Christianity is our national religion. Because we don't need Christianity to be nationalized. What we need is Christianity to be practiced. Back to the two families from the book of your small things. At the end of their book or at the end of their year, the authors and the messengers narrowed down their list and how their families could live their lives after this experiment. And they chose to adopt three simple rules based upon John Wesley. Because I think that one year was a pretty tough year. And they are. First, to do no harm. Second, to do good. And third is to stay in love with God. 
Or another option they decided would be to write a family mission statement that says, our family exists to, and then fill in that blank. And every time a decision is to be made in the house, they write up their decision by looking at those three simple rules of John Wesley. Do no harm, do good, and stay in love with God. Or they line up their decision next to their family's mission statement. A gracious, loving God has been patient with us in this world. And one day, Jesus will judge us. And the power that he will place us will be totally decided through him, by him, so that praise and honor will be given to God Almighty. Frederick Buechner, who is a theologian, reminds us of a time when Jesus was going to the cross to sacrifice himself for others. And Peter said that he did not know Jesus. Does anyone really know the full extent of who Jesus is? Jesus continues to teach us in his parables his identity. He teaches us through his parables where his way is opposite of the world's way. Jesus' prayer for us is that we move in confidence of his love and in our mission to speak the truth of the gospel. And he says in John 14, verses 12 through 14, Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works that I have been doing. And they will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father for them. We see this love around the table. We see the love of Christ that is embodied in us, loving, forgiving, sharing, and reconciling all that this year has brought us. Our Bible study that we just started is called The Walk by Adam Hamilton, and we hope that you will consider joining us for those who are not attending. And in The Walk, we are learning that there are five essential practices or characteristics of a Christian. To say we are Christian, a disciple, a learner, with Jesus as our teacher, is to do these five things. Worship and prayer. We worship in this beautiful church built with servant hands, and we pray here and worship in alone. Second, study. Third, serve. Fourth, give. And fifth, we share of ourselves and of our resources. It is the five things that make us Christian. And no matter whatever happens in the world or in the church, the big church, us being church together in the world, we will meet that standard or benchmark of presenting to the world who we are through these five practices. Worship and prayer, study, service, giving, and sharing. We put this first in our life because Jesus teaches us to do this out of his love for our sake and for the sake of others and for our testimony. So here's the good news. God is patient. And we will shine, the last verse, we will shine like the righteous, the sun in the kingdom of the Father. Amen? So let us not judge one another and let us be patient as God has with us. Let us love one another just as Jesus has loved us. Let us do no harm, do good, and stay in love with God. Let us not worry about who we become and prepare ourselves to be worthy enough to dwell alongside Jesus. Whether it's the five essential practices or the practices of these two families, let us choose. Let us choose a practice in which we can align ourselves with the teachings of Jesus and produce righteous and goodness harvest for the kingdom of God. Let us pray. Almighty gracious God, as in every generation you send forth laborers to do your work and equip
equip them by your word. So we pray that in this time you will continue to send forth your spirit by that word. Equip your servants with everything good that they need to do your will, working in them that which is well-pleasing in your sight. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our hymn of invitation is Jesus Calls Us. On page 592, we're on the screen. If you have not professed your faith, if you have not professed that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, and if you would like to do that this morning, we invite you to come forth. And I would extend on behalf of the congregation, I would extend the right hand of fellowship. If you just want to transfer your membership, we welcome you to do that as well. And again, on behalf of the church, that I would welcome you to do in this beloved community. Would you please rise for our hymn of invitation, Jesus Calls Us, on page 592. Abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Go in peace.